Well, we're going to be in Philippians this morning. Philippians chapter 4. So uh, we finished our series in Revelation last week. We're going to start a new series next week, a Christmas series. Um, I'm going to, it's going to be kind of a, a more of a topical series. Uh, we're going to land on, on a certain scripture in each sermon, um, but they're going to be uh, somewhat based around Christmas songs. So, so each sermon will have a certain Christmas song that corresponds to it. And so I'm looking forward to, to doing that. Um, but uh, you could say this is a standalone sermon. We're in Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. So uh, you probably know Philippians 4, 13, a very popular verse, and that's why I chose it. Um, I think uh, there might be some fresh insight for you this morning on this popular verse. Let me begin by reading to you an article. Here's the title of the article. Context. Paul wrote Philippians 4.13 after narrowly winning church softball game. <laughs> Dallas, Texas. You may have heard that the Apostle Paul wrote Philippians 4 to address suffering and persecution in the Christian life. But biblical scholars working at Dallas Theological Seminary have been able to confirm that the famous declaration, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, was actually scribbled down by the Apostle Paul after he knocked in the go-ahead run at a local church softball game. According to scholars, Paul had been temporarily let out of confinement in Rome to play with the local Roman church softball league, and he penned the verse in his excitement after narrowly beating the local synagogue 4-3. to three. Quote, our current working theory is that Paul wrote the first portion of chapter 4, headed out to play in the local church softball game, and then returns to confinement to excitedly jot down the legendary verse 13. Dr. Darrell Bach, senior New Testament researcher, said, He was so elated from the come-from-behind victory that he just had to pass something on for believers engaged in difficult trials in their sports games, be it basketball, baseball, football, or even soccer. According to Bach, this discovery isn't just important for scholars, it has practical implications for believers even today. Quote, the implication of this discovery for the modern believer is immediate and practical. We know now that the proper contextual application of this verse is for us to use in sports games, Bach added. Christians should feel free to print the verse on their workout shirts, sweat towels, baseball caps, whatever. At publishing time, Old Testament scholars had confirmed that the prophet Jeremiah had penned Jeremiah 29, 11, just after his oldest son graduated high school. <laughs> so, I'm sure you picked up very quickly that uh, that is satire. And of course, that's not the context of Philippians 4.13, uh, but it does reflect how it's often used. Um, sports games, and we could even give more examples, and we will as we go on. Uh, I can't help but wonder how many people actually are aware of the context of Philippians 4.13. This context is very important. Um, it seems like uh, we see this verse, just we always see it in isolation, right? Uh, quick Google search will show you that you can, you can buy all kinds of items with Philippians 4.13 posted on it, from posters to bracelets to dog tags to rocks to keychains to wooden signs, metal signs, canvases, t-shirts, Bumper stickers, coffee mugs, and Christian ornam uh, Christmas ornaments. And that's, that's just uh, after doing a quick Google search. Um, what I want to do this morning is to free this verse from isolation and place it back in its natural habitat. And, and my prayer is that this verse will become even more meaningful to you. Because you know, a, lot of a lot of people might say, oh, you know, Philippians 4.13 is my favorite verse. Uh, it's probably at, at the very top of the list of people's favorite verses. Um, I pray that, uh, that this uh, sermon this morning um, will help you see it in a new light and maybe appreciate it even more. So let's uh, go ahead and read the passage. Would you stand with me in honor of reading God's word? Philippians 4. We'll just read 10 through 13 now, and then I'll read... Uh, the final portion later. Let's begin in verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned to be 
I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. I'm, and in, every, in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Let's pray. God, I pray that you will give us insight this morning through your word, by your Holy Spirit. Help us to see the deeper meaning and application of this verse. And help us, help it to lead us to, uh, to Jesus and to finding our joy, our satisfaction, our contentment in him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I said that I wanted to free this verse from isolation and place it back in its natural habitat. Well, ironically, uh, the natural habitat of this verse is in the prison epistle of Philippians. Right? Paul wrote this letter to the Philippians from prison. And we see clearly in the immediate context of this verse that it's not about scoring home runs. And it's not even about pursuing good and worthy goals, career goals, losing weight, uh, whatever, right? Things uh, perhaps even more important than sports games. It's not even about those kinds of things. Rather, we see that this verse is about being content no matter what the circumstance. Did you know that? This, this oft, often quoted verse, Philippians 4.13, it's really about being content in whatever your circumstances may be. Again, look at verse 11. It says, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. And then verse 12 is just an elaboration of that, right? Saying that in all kinds of situations, good and bad, I've learned to be content in all these things. And then we have the famous verse, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Or we might even say, I can do all these things, right? Because, again, context is really important here, and we, we understand that he's not talking about hitting the home run, but he's talking about being content in good times and in bad times, in easy times and hard times. I can do all these things through him who strengthens me. And so that might, that might burst your bubble a little, uh, but again, I, I pray that uh, it doesn't, right? To, you know, to, to, to think that this verse is not about winning in every area of your life. Well, if we just stop there, um, maybe that would be something to be upset about, right? Uh, that this, this verse uh, isn't uh, appropriate for all the uses that I've, um, all the ways that I've made use of it. But there's a but. Uh, there's something greater that, that I want you to see. Yes, it's not, uh, although it's not about winning in every area of your life, uh, it's, it's about something so much better. And just let me give you a couple of reasons uh, why I think this, this contextual understanding of it, uh, that is about being content, why I think it's actually, it's not only the, the true application, but it actually is better for us. Um, first of all, because it delivers, okay? Um, this, uh, this text, um, when we understand it rightly, it actually does deliver. Now, when you understand it in, in the way that uh, we kind of parodied earlier, um, well, you'll see that it doesn't always deliver, does it? As fervently as you might claim, Philippians 4.13, before every big endeavor, you know that you were going to fail in life, and you have failed in life. And understand that it's not because Christ has failed you, but maybe it's because you failed to understand the proper application of this verse. And, and there's even broader implications here, just, just for what this Christian life is all about, what our expectations should be as Christians. Uh, but understand that uh, um, Christ has not failed you. Whenever we understand and embrace this verse for what it really is about, we see that it does deliver. It does deliver on its promise. That is, that we can be content, whatever the circumstance, through Christ, through Him who strengthens me and you. Now, it's not always easy. But, uh, but, but, it, but it does deliver. It is true. Second, the proper understanding of this um, is better because it's substantive and not superficial. And that's to say that the proper understanding of this verse, this passage, it, it deeply roots us in Jesus as our greatest treasure. 
While frankly, the uh, popular understanding tends to, tends to simply see Jesus as a means to an end, right? Whether it's a, a sports goal or a career goal or losing weight or even things of even greater importance than, than those. Uh, we don't want to simply see Jesus as a means to an end. I can do this through Christ who strengthens me. Now, so let me back up and say that, yes, God can give us the strength to do certain things. So it's not, it's not to say that God doesn't strengthen us to do certain tasks, but it's to say that it's not what this verse is about. And that, in fact, this verse is about something um, much deeper and much greater. That is that we can find our satisfaction, we can find our contentment in Christ no matter what the situation Okay, so that's um, just some introductory stuff, but uh, now let's move on to this first point. And we're going to have three points. Uh, so basically, these first two points are going to um, specify what, how we can be content in situations both good and bad. And then finally, um, where this contentment comes from, where this strength to have contentment comes from. Okay, so first of all, I can be content in times of ease and plenty. I can be content in times of ease and plenty through him who strengthens me. Now, while the word plenty uh, is used in our text this morning, the word ease is not. But this is the sense of what Paul is saying. Um, and it stands in contrast to the word trouble in verse 14. And that's what we see Paul is doing, right? We see that he's making these contrasts, especially there in verse 12, uh, being brought low and, and he knows how to abound. Plenty, hunger, abundance, need. Right, so so he's, he's making these contrasts and saying on both ends of the spectrum, I can be content. So first of all, in ease and in plenty. Clearly we see here that Paul has learned to be content in ease, in abundance, in plenty. That sounds really tough, doesn't it? To be content in ease and abundance and plenty. You might think, at least at first glance, okay, well that sounds pretty easy. Right, to be content in ease and abundance and plenty. Um, you, you might even wonder why I'm even bothering to, to talk about this. Right? It, it, is not Paul just noting that he's, he's been on both extremes? And, but should we not just simply focus on, on those times of need and how it can be content in times of need? Well, it is true that Paul is, is, is showing, he's, he's highlighting these extremes and saying that he's been in both situations. But not only that, Paul is recognizing that it's hard on both ends of the spectrum to be content. And I think that if we think about it, we can, we can recognize that, that it is um, difficult even in ease and in plenty. That is to say that ease and plenty do not solve our discontentment. In fact, often it can stir it up. We've all heard stories of uh, people maybe inheriting a lot of money, maybe winning the lottery. What's, what's the pattern? Uh, do these people often uh, just maybe raise their standard of living just a little bit and then wisely invest and save the rest of the money? Is that usually what happens? No, it's, 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 it's not. In fact, the, the uh, National Endowment for Financial Education estimates that as many as 70% of Americans who come upon a great amount of money will suddenly lose all that money within just a few years. 70%. So whether it's the lottery or inheritance or whatever it is, 70% of people, it's, it's gone after just a few years. It's because they're seeking contentment in possessions and they never find it. And so it's, it's like, you know, you keep spending and spending and spending. Okay, if I just have this, if I just have this, then, then I'll be content. Um, but uh, you're, you're feeding a monster and it doesn't, it doesn't work. And, you know, we can, we can all be guilty of that on, on a smaller scale, can't we? Um... You know, we, we think, okay, if, if I just had this one thing, you know, there's just this one thing, and I'm going to work hard for it, and once I get this one thing, then, then everything's going to be right, and then I'm going to be content, then I'm going to be happy. And then there's just another thing on the list, and another thing, and another thing, right? We can fall into that trap. It's a lie. It's a lie, right? Uh, ease and plenty, abundance, all, you know, good times are not going to bring us contentment. What we need is Jesus as our all-satisfying treasure. We need Jesus. And you know, simply coming to church and saying the bedtime prayers, it's not going to cover it. Right? That, that is not treasuring Jesus as what is um, most valuable and what gives you most satisfaction and joy. Right? It takes more than just that. It's got to be radical. Right? If, if you really want to find your contentment in Christ, 
if, 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 you're, if you're recognizing now that, okay, yeah, you're right, uh, no, ma no matter how many possessions I get or even you know, career goals or whatever it might be, these things are not going to, to feed this greater need, this, this greater desire, this greater yearning that I have. If you're recognizing that, know that uh, Jesus can fill it, but it's, it's going to take some, some reckless abandon. It's going to take something radical. Again, it's not just coming to church and saying your bedtime prayers. That's not going to fill that hole. Um, you, you, you've got to truly recognize and embrace Jesus as your all-satisfying treasure. I think of the song that we sing sometimes, uh, All I Have is Christ. The chorus is real simple. Alleluia, all I have is Christ. Alleluia, Jesus is my life. Can you say that? Can you say, all I have is Christ? Well, yes, of course we have other things, but, but the point of that is to say that, that the only thing that really matters is Jesus. Jesus is my life. Take, take anything and everything you want, just give me Jesus and I'll be satisfied. Can you say that? You know, that's what Paul clung to in good times and in bad times. And that's what, that we, that's what we must cling to uh, if we want to have Jesus as our all satisfying treasure. We want to find contentment in Him. So we've got to recognize that even in even times of ease and plenty, or maybe even especially times of ease and plenty, that uh, it's, it's going to be hard to find contentment uh, apart from Christ, and that Jesus really is the answer. So that was the first point. I can be content in times of ease and plenty. Number two, I can be content in times of trouble and need. This was Paul's current circumstance as he wrote this, kind of. I say kind of well, well, because we see that, yes, he is in prison, right? He's writing this epistle from prison. And then in verse 14, uh, he mentions his trouble. He says, yes, yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. But because the Philippians had shared in his trouble, he goes on to say that he's well supplied. And he actually has quite an optimistic outlook. Um, let's go ahead and just read uh, verses 14 through 20 now so you can have a little bit more insight on the context here and, and see, see what I'm talking about. So verse 14 is when he says, Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. Even in Thessal Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. Right? So Paul's all about spreading the gospel. He's saying that uh, others have left me high and dry and I found myself in need uh, throughout my ministry, but you have time and time and time again have come and have helped me. And, uh, and there's, there's been fruit because of it. And by the way, even, even here in prison, we read in, in, in Philippians that he's, he's ministering to others. He's spreading the gospel among the guards and, and, and those uh, that are in his presence, in his confinement. But let's continue on. Uh, verse 18, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the, gift that you, the gifts that you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, so there's the full context, or, or uh, that is what follows this famous verse. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Um, so, uh, again, Paul is, even though he's in prison... And, and, and know that, that prison, no matter how well supplied he is, prison's not fun, okay? Um, so, so, so Paul is, is no doubt in a bad situation, um, but he's, uh, he's grateful. He's grateful. And, uh, well, I, I think it's fitting for us to, to note all of the other trials that Paul has been through because uh, in verse 12, again, Paul he, he alludes to this, to, to all of the troubles, to the need, to the hunger, um, to all of these difficulties that he's faced. Uh, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty four through 28 is a really helpful passage for us to get uh, a real sense of the trials that he's gone through. So I'm just going to read it. You don't have to turn there. Um, we see that Paul faced all kinds of trouble and need throughout his life. He says, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. 
Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys, in danger from river, rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, and toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. But I can be content, Paul says. Through him who strengthens me. I can be content. That's what Paul's saying here in Philippians. So are you facing difficulty? Do you find it hard to be content? Understand Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer in the good times and in the bad times. And if Jesus is not at this center... Uh, you're likely going to be chasing contentment for the rest of your life, no matter what the circumstances, whether good or bad. We see for Paul that Jesus was at the center, right? And, and, and this, this is what allowed him to be content in both ease and plenty and in times of trouble and need. Now, are there methods outside of Christ that might help somebody find a higher level of contentment? Sure. Sure, there are, there are some methods outside of Christ that might help a person find a higher level of contentment. I saw, I saw a Chinese guy once cutting his lawn with scissors. Isn't that interesting? This is when I, I was a youth pastor in Oklahoma City, and uh, it, was, it was the inner city, and, and uh, I picked up the youth on, on a bus route. And so uh, I picked them up before the Wednesday night service, and that's when I passed by this, this guy um, just crouching down, cutting his lawn with scissors. So I picked, up, picked the youth up, took them to church. We had our you know, hour, hour and a half service. Uh, then I took them back. And then when I was on the route back, he was still out there cutting his grass with scissors. I don't, I don't know what's up with that. I don't, I don't know if, if, uh, if there was some kind of like um, meditation meth behind it or what. But uh, maybe, maybe you should try it, right? You can, you can, you can cut your grass with scissors. And, and, and perhaps it would help you learn some patience. Maybe it'd help you find a higher level of contentment, all right, if you cut your lawn with your grass, right? You'd, you'd be thankful for our, our modern conveniences, right? Uh, that might help you to have some contentment, but I guarantee you that it will not give you the all-satisfying joy that we can find in Christ. And so Jesus really is the answer. So through Christ, we can have contentment and ease and plenty in times of trouble and in need. And then finally, let's get to this last phrase, through him who strengthens me. Now notice um, in my translation, and I, I would think in most of your translations, it says him who strengthens me. I do know that in the King James Version, it says through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, the reason for that difference is because uh, you know, the King James translation uh, was uh, translated in the year 1611, and uh, they didn't have as many manuscripts then, and the manuscripts were much uh, later. Uh, but the, you know, since then, uh, there have been many, many uh, New Testament Greek manuscripts discovered, uh, many, many of which are um, much older or earlier, close, that is closer to the date of the original writing. And in these manuscripts, it says him rather than Christ. And so it probably did say him in the original, and at some point a scribe wrote the word Christ, which it is true, right, that it is, that, that, that is our source of strength, right? Um, it is Christ who strengthens us, but that's just an explanation for why uh, these more modern translations say him, while the KJV says Christ. But it is Christ who strengthens us, or more generally, Paul could be referring simply to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, since, since the evidence seems to point to him simply saying him, um, it could be this more general divine source of strength, right? But that's the point, that Paul credits his contentment not to himself, but to a divine source, to God, right? Paul credits it not to himself, but to God. And, uh, and we must rely on the same source of strength. And we must, we must recognize that uh, that, that this, this strength to be content in good times and in bad times, it can't come within ourselves. Right? We, we, we can try all kinds of methods. We can cut our grass with scissors or do whatever we want. And yeah, it, 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 might, it might have some effect, but, uh, but ultimately it's, it's going to fail us. It's not going to give us 
that longing, that, um, you, know, a, a, you know, this is kind of cheesy, but you hear people say that God-shaped hole in our hearts. Um, but, but it really is true, right? There, there, there is something that we long for, something that we desire that only God can fill. And so uh, we must recognize that, that uh, um, only through Christ, only through God can we have the strength that we need uh, to, uh, to be content. And so let me, let me close with just a couple of words of advice on seeking contentment. And so the, so the first is to, to pray for it, because we recognize that, that we are dependent upon this divine source. We are dependent upon God, and, and ultimately in finding our joy and our satisfaction in Christ. Right? We, we, we can't find it anywhere else. We can't muster it up within ourselves. We can't find it from any outside guru, um, but we need Jesus. So we ought to pray for it. Um, whether, whether you're in a high or a low and, and, and you're thinking, okay, I just, need this, I just need this one more thing to make me content. Say, no, what I need is Jesus. And pray, pray that, that, uh, that um, supernaturally that contentment would be given to you. But of course, we don't just, we don't just pray and sit back. We have, to, we have to be active in pursuing Christ. And so the second point of advice, the first is to pray. The second is to seek your fulfillment in Christ. Taste and see that the Lord is good and then savor it. Meditate on God's word. Prioritize prayer and worship and fellowship with the body of Christ. Serve others in his name. Put away idols and distractions, things that might compete for your attention and your affections. Put those things away and incline your heart to the Lord. Put it simply, make Jesus your treasure. Treasure him above all things and, and, and structure your life around that. That's how you can find your contentment in Christ. And I'm preaching to myself as well. I'm always preaching to myself as well. Because um, even, even, even for a pastor, um, it's, it's easy to look to other things. Uh, but we, we, all, we always have to remind ourselves that Jesus is the answer. Paul helps us with this, right? That, that's, 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 that's one of the things about reading scripture. We, we, can, we can see the example of Paul and we can, we can um, aspire to it. If we just flip back in our Bibles to chapter three, verses seven through 11, oh, how I pray that we would share the attitude and affection that Paul has here in these verses. He says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection of the dead. With that kind of perspective, it's impossible to not be content. And so, as we think of this verse, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, know that it doesn't mean you're gonna have victory in every single area of your life. Um, you're, you're going to lose your job. You're going to have health issues. You're going to face all kinds of problems. And you can, and you can pray for God to change those circumstances. That's fine. But, but what's most important is that in the midst of those circumstances, and not just the bad circumstances, but also the good circumstances, right? In the midst of both, we pray, Lord, help me to not seek contentment in anything else, but to find it in you. And, and, and we can pray for this um, supernatural strength to do that, to look to Christ and nothing else. Let's pray together. Dear God, we, uh, we thank you for Jesus, and we thank you that he is a source of, of joy and contentment and satisfaction that, uh, that nothing can compare to. So help us to really believe that. And we pray that by your spirit, Lord, that you will help us to have the strength to 
find our contentment, our satisfaction in Christ in good times and in bad times. Help us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name.